Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Jacob Tingen. I'm here with my partner, James Williams. Hello, everyone. We are with Tingen Law. We're a law firm based out of Richmond, Virginia. And we're going to be talking today about immigration law in the gaming industry. So uh, we are on Twitch. Uh, our handle is Team Gavel. And uh, James streams pretty regularly. Sometimes I'll pop in as well. And we've played a variety of games and talked about a bunch of different legal topics. Um, I started my law firm in 2012 after graduating law school, um, kind of as a general practice firm, but today we focus primarily on immigration and business and IP issues, and our clients include companies and professional athletes, among uh, many other types of entities. Let's see. Uh, so this is me. I'm the managing partner of the firm. I also teach a class as adjunct faculty at the University of Richmond Law School um, called the Immigrant Rights Practicum. It's a pretty neat opportunity to get law students involved on real clients' cases. Sometimes we even get to represent with the students, uh, clients in immigration court, keep them in the country. It's pretty neat. Uh, my practice areas of focus are immigration, business law, and intellectual property. And hello again. My name is James. I've been practicing for two years. As listed on the screen, I do IP, like copyright and trademark consultations. I also cover business entity formation, entertainment, and I do local Virginia family law. So what are we going to talk about? Well, the title is gaming or immigration law in the gaming industry. So we're going to talk about places where you have immigration intersecting with the gaming industry, whether you're an athlete, an esports athlete, you're a company trying to hire talent, or somewhere else in between. We've got examples of various cases. We've got situations and types of visas that we're going to try to explain and see what we can do. Uh, James, what happened? Uh, did it crash? Uh, I, I don't, what's happening? Who are you? A blindfold? Well, what's your game? Patchport edition. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I guess we have no choice. We have to play the game. Everybody grab your PAX port and let's do this. All right, let's see what happens. I guess we'll start with level one. Okay, well, it looks like I am player one for level one. So we got to figure out where we are in the industry, where we are coming from generally. So where do we are or where are we? Well, we're, get, we're getting some help here from PAX Eastia. She's an angel. James, do you have a laser pointer in your pocket? I didn't. Oh, I guess I have one. All right. So we need you to help us point the way here, all right? So let's see what's going on. OK, well, at least we know we're here in Pax Eastia. We're going to be talking about the gaming industry. So let's figure out if we know what's going on or not. Does James know the answer how we got here, or does he not? What do you guys think? B, he does not know. Let's see what he knows. Oh, the text says I do know. Wow, <laughs> this is great. Here we go. So we're going to talk about where we are in the gaming industry. Over the past 10 years, things have changed quite a bit, especially for immigration, with some of the first P visas being granted to esports athletes, League of Legends, Dota, Smash. Everything is slowly starting to change. The IP industry or the IP practice area covering gaming has also changed significantly with newer tech. So everything is changing. Is immigration law catching up? That's the other question. You are super smart, James. I'm going to agree with Pax Eastia. Um, so one of my first questions is, is there a visa for gamers? What do we think? Yes, no, or maybe so? There's a visa for gamers? OK. Well. Not specifically. It's one of those not exactly, right? So there are visas that gamers are eligible for, but there's not a visa specifically tailored to gamers. You can get a B visa for coming in and tourist or business purposes. You can also get a P visa if you're coming in for a competition. We can talk about each of those a little bit more in depth, but that's just the industry where we are now. So James, can you kind of give us a little more detail on what a P visa is? And let's see if our audience knows anything about this. What, what do we think? A, B, or C, everybody? A. A. All right. Yeah. So the answer was correct. It's traditionally for athletes and entertainers. The idea for P visas is 
you're a person who has international acclaim. It's not just, hey, I'm pretty cool and I want to come hang out in the US. You have to meet certain criteria. You have to be able to show, hey, I've met international rankings. People know who I am. Maybe not the CBP, maybe not USCIS, but I have an international audience. I'm going to jump in here and just kind of, immigration law is a bit of an alphabet soup. So CBP is Customs and Border Protection. USCIS is United States Citizenship and Immigration Service. And if we throw out any other, you know, acronyms, just raise your hand and be like, you guys are not talking English, okay? <laughs> so we know what's going on. So James, I thought, you know, Paxista has a good point. The law is supposed to be about predictability, precedent. So are there any problems because of this gap between the law and the, the video game industry? What do you guys think? No, no problems. No. <laughs> I mean, that definitely sounds ideal, but no. I mean, there are absolutely problems on a regular basis. Even if something seems like it's clear, you still might have issues like people coming with a visa that's already been approved. We've got a couple examples like Leffen and Admiral Bulldog. They had visas. They showed up and CBP turned them away. So um, on the bottom example for Admiral Bulldog, coming to commentate on a Dota 2 competition, Valve had talked with him and a lot of people and one of the go-to options at the time was get a B visa, you don't need permanent employment or an employment-based visa. And you know, it made sense, but he was turned away. And through conversation with CBP with Customs and Border uh, Protection, you know, they must have heard something to the effect of, you're coming here for work. Well, if they don't know anything about gaming, if they don't know anything about Valve, Riot, a lot of the big publisher companies, then, you know, you kind of have to be able to be prepared and be ready to explain those situations, because otherwise you'll come here, you'll be doing exactly what you're told to do, and it might not work out. Yeah, uh, a lot of times when they, when in law school and whatnot, they tell you, you know, you need to educate the judge. And so that's not like, judges aren't idiots, right? You know, but the law is too vast for any one person to know everything. And so it's frequent that you have to educate people about what's going on so that they understand, hey, I do qualify for this legal benefit. Okay, James, looks like we answered all the questions on this level. All right, I think I'm done for the rest of the day, right? I, we'll see. <laughs> okay, let's go back to the levels. Let's go to level two, your basic. Let's see. Okay, Jacob, this one is you. I yes. got to take a little back seat. Here we go. Okay, so it looks like we're gonna talk about the basic concepts for immigration law. All right, what do we do? Well, it looks like Pax ECU is gonna have some questions. So, first question, do we think Jacob is ready? <laughs> Am I ready? I will see. I was born ready. Check <laughs> it out, yes. All right. You go ahead. So Pax Eastia is definitely getting on to something here. Immigration law is very complicated, very slow to change, like most types of law. So we do have two types of visas that we could talk about specifically for immigration in the gaming context. But let's first ask, Jacob, what are the differences between immigrant and non-immigrant visas? So the answer is, the answer is C. The answer is long and complicated, okay? So there are two primary categories of visas in U.S. immigration law generally, okay? Um, and those categories are immigrant visas versus non-immigrant visas. Uh, an immigrant visa means I'm gonna come to the U.S. permanently to live as a permanent resident. A non-immigrant visa is everything else. I'm coming to, um, to visit, to learn, to study, to work temporarily, but I'm not coming for forever. So examples include, you know, student visas, those kinds of things. Uh, but in particular to the gaming industry, we're seeing uh, non-immigrant visas like B1, B2 visitor visas, P visas, O visas, and then also just visa waiver entrance, which is kind of silly that, you know, we have all these visas you have to get, but then you can always just waive it, you know? So um, sometimes it just depends what you, what you need. Okay, so Pax is bringing up another point. You're coming for a temporary purpose. You, you're gonna get a visa, potentially. So does it really matter if you're only gonna be here for a limited amount of time? What does the audience think? B1, 
be. Same. Yes, it matters. See, it depends. So it depends on what you plan to do, right? So it depends on if you're gonna be here for a long time, how long you plan to be here, what you plan to do while you're here. The visa you, you, you get does matter. So, um, but most visa issues related to the gaming industry that you've seen in headlines that are most relevant to us today are non-immigrant visas. So that's where Blindfold's game is gonna focus. All right, so we talked about a few different types of visas. We also mentioned the visa waiver program. What do we think that the visa waiver program is? The C? There, there's not a C on this slide, man. What? Oh gosh, it's getting into the hidden tapes. <laughs> okay. A, the visa waiver program, it just lets people from participating countries enter the US without, without the need for a visa. Okay, so we have relationships with certain countries. They're on similar socioeconomic status with the US. We're not worried about people coming and staying forever. And so we just waive the need for them to get a specific visa in their passport before they come in. So that's how that works. Okay, so we've just learned that you can come in on a visa waiver. Why would we want to look at a B1 or B2 visa for somebody like Admiral Bulldog who got turned away? Yeah, yeah. So not every country participates in the visa waiver program, right? So it's not something that we let everybody do. And then also you can stay longer. So on a visa waiver, you can enter for up to 90 days at a time. On a B1, B2 visa, you can come in and stay for up to six months at a given time. Um, and then additionally, there are, some, there are some nuances in the law that matter occasionally um, for, for visa waiver people. We're not gonna get into that today, it's too nuanced. But just be aware that even though we're covering some broad things, there are some details that get very specific, very nitty gritty on some of these kinds of visas. Ah, that's my slide that explains all of that. Oh, I guess it's also important, this is important, for B visas and the visa waiver entrance, you can't come to work, okay? So you can get prize winnings, that doesn't count, that's an exception to the income rule, but you can't come to work on a B visa. Okay, you can only come to visit. You can come for some limited business purposes, negotiate contracts, attend PACs, do some other cool things, uh, but you cannot like be a W-2 on a visitor's visa. You don't have work authorization. If you're gonna come and you're working with the studio here in the United States, you gotta look at either H-1B visas or other types of visas that are more heavily employment focused. And frankly, they're just a little bit more nuanced than what we're gonna talk about here. Okay, so now PAX ECU wants to know, you mentioned other types of visas, the P and the O visas. What are those? What do we think? B, all right. Right, so they are visas for people who are internationally recognized, internationally acclaimed. Um, you can work on a P visa, right? You can get, a, you can get W-2 status. Um, and I'm talking about IRS tax status, right? They can pay you traditionally. But the thing to recognize is that, um, again, the gaming as an industry, particularly for, for competitors or esports athletes, is still kind of new. And so the immigration official who's looking at these applications may not have a clue, right? And so it takes some convincing. P visas can be issued for individuals or teams. O visas are only for individuals. The way that I like to explain it is like your O visa is Michael Jordan and the P visa is everybody else on his team, right? So, um, and, and ideally when you submit this application, you submit it with evidence of serious international acclaim. People definitely know who you are in your industry and what you do. And so um, you wanna make sure, particularly in a gaming uh, visa application, that you, you put enough evidence in for the guy on the immigration side to say, whoa, and like compare to traditional industries as well and say, wow, this person is better known than Michael Jordan, right, worldwide. And one thing I'd like to add really quickly on P visas and just P and O visas in general, if we're thinking about it in the traditional sports context, like let's think about it in an Olympics event, right? So you've got somebody who is potentially coming for a very big, groundbreaking athletic event. Well, realistically, you're gonna want to potentially come in and train, you know, exercise, get acclimated if the climate's different, if the altitude, all of those things. So with the P visa, you can come in and as long as you have your route planned, you have the date of the competition, you have the date of whatever the event is, 
and you say, hey, I've got a trainer, I've got all of this stuff worked out, then that's how you get to stay for the lengths of time within the visas. Yeah, so P visas can be approved for periods up to five years, can be renewed once for an additional five years. O visas can be granted for three years and then renewed infinitely. Um, let's see if Pax Eastia has anything else. Okay, so now Pax Eastia is saying, hey, what about those immigrant visas? Well, they're not attacking us right now, Jim. So I think we'll move on and move from the basic level. All right. What should we do now? Level three or the secret bonus round? Let's do the secret round. Why not? All right, here we go. Here we go. The land of pitfalls. Hey, we get to co-op this one. This is great. Multiplayer mode. All right, so I, I didn't know Blindfold had a castle, but let's keep moving. <laughs> Okay, so we've been answering these questions. So far, it's nothing that we haven't felt like we can handle. But we only have a staff and a sword. Okay, so Pax Eastia is telling us about Team Gavel. So just to plug us a bit, <laughs> shamelessly. So come visit us on Twitch sometime after the conference, okay? We'll keep talking about different issues uh, uh, on the law and video games, um, but it's not, not so important right now. Let's keep moving. <laughs> Okay, right. so now Pax Eastia has another question. What do you guys think? Do immigrants coming to the country have constitutional rights? There we go. All right. I, I see a future lawyer out here. Somebody shouted, it depends, right? Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. So uh, for immigrants or people who are not citizens, who are not permanent residents, we're going to talk about a very specific time period. We're talking about you're on the plane, you land in the airport or the port of entry. In that very limited context, you don't have a lot of status. You don't have a lot of these rights. So there are some limited rights. There are certain privileges. I mean, you are a human being. However, when we're talking about immigration, coming to the United States, a lot of it is discretionary. Yeah, so there are a number of like lawyer groups out there that are very upset about this, and for good reason. You know, the Constitution talks about rights for people, not citizens, and so presumably all of the rights should be afforded to everybody, right? But our courts and our government have found that we have a strong national interest in regulating who comes in and out. And so if a CBP official stops you and you're an immigrant, um, you have very limited rights. And so a lot of people think, Okay, if they stop you for an interview, like one of the people from the earlier slides that was stopped, one of the gamers, seven hour interview before his visa was denied. Seven hours, right? So you're stuck in a room, can't go anywhere. Do you have a right to an attorney? No, <laughs> you do not have a right to an attorney. And so what do you do? Um, you're on your own, you can't have a lawyer. You call one, they're not gonna let him stay on the phone. They show up at the, the airport, they're not gonna let him in the interview room with you. So that's something that you should be aware of. Yeah. So, we've kind of already touched on this. We just want to have a little summary again here to say, immigrating to the United States, it's not always easy. It's not always something that you can expect on a regular basis to happen exactly how it's happened before. And more importantly, as we're talking about the gaming industry, just know that the first P visa, the first visa that was granted to a player was done within the last 10 years. So we're not talking about something that has happened with regularity or that's established, not only within USCIS, but just generally speaking. So, you know, we have to, you know, as attorneys, as gamers, as companies who are all in this industry, we all have to work together to advocate and to shift the culture, you know, to say, hey, esports is real, it's here. All of the companies who are working within the gaming industry, whether it's specifically in the sub niche of esports or not, we need something that's gonna work so that we can have these people. Because, you know, these competitions, hundreds of thousands of dollars can be on the line. We've got players who are on a lot of top-notch teams that are competing. So we're starting to see a little bit more maturity in the industry. And with that, we need some change. Right. So it's, it's interesting that um, border officials in particular, they have tons of discretion. And so one of the jobs that you might have to do as a lawyer, educating clients, or as a client coming in, 
uh, or if you work with people who are in these scenarios, is make sure that they know how to explain to that border official, hey, I am coming for a Super Smash Brothers competition. So, Pax Easty has a good question. Can you be denied entry into the U.S. even if you got a visa? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can, and it does kind of depend on a bunch of things. They can absolutely deny you. They have all this discretion in the world, and it's, it's, it's kind of crazy that you can go through the process, you can create a completely intense application, get that visa, that P1 visa that was originally designed for athletes and world entertainers and get it for a gamer, and then still be denied at your entry to the US. So what do you do if Customs and Border Protection stops you and wants to interview you for seven hours? What do you do? Cry. <laughs> Cry. Yeah. I, we should have put that as an answer. Yeah. Sorry. We'll call you next time. Uh, <laughs> do none of those things. All right, yeah. So basically, as we mentioned, you don't have the same type of rights immediately at the point of entry at the border. So you're working with somebody who's got a very shifted power dynamic, right? They're in all of the power to say, no, get back on a plane, goodbye. And what do we do in those alternate power distribution situations? Well, I mean, the unfortunate part is you just kind of have to play ball. You need to come in, know what you're doing, have your script ready, so to speak, be polite, and just try to do as much as you can. Because otherwise, it's discretionary, they will send you uh, on your way. Right, so you, you can't uh, refuse to answer. That's one of the interesting things. So typically when we advise clients uh, and they talk about an interaction with law enforcement, my gut as a lawyer is to say, say nothing, be quiet, <laughs> wait for me to show up. But in this scenario, nobody's coming. The lawyer cannot come. You are literally on your own. And if you refuse to answer any questions, they're just going to put you back on the plane. You know, there's nothing you can do. And so you have to answer questions. Um, and so in this scenario, I think the best approach is to make sure that your visa and your purpose for coming match up before you get here. And then probably if you have like that P1 visa, don't just bring the visa in your passport, like bring a copy of the application and be like, no, dude, look, I sent all this stuff in. Um, the other thing you can do is, um, yeah, I mean, so you want to explain to them with, with your evidence, like, look, you can compete in the Settlers of Catan competition. The other thing you want to do is make sure that you don't use words that are going to get you denied, right? So if you're coming on a B1 visa, it is totally allowed to compete and take your prize winnings home. That doesn't count as, it's an exception to the income, uh, the no income requirement of the B1 visa, right? But if you come in and you're competing in a competition and you say, oh yeah, I do this for work, they, then they'll look at you and say, oh, you're working, huh? And then off you go, you don't get to come in. And so as a client, as somebody who's trying to get in, you, you need to know like, okay, I can't say the word work. <laughs> I can't say the word money at all, but you can say prize winnings. And then when they Google it in their manual of policies and procedures, they'll be like, oh yeah, prize winnings, you can do that. Um, but you need to just kind of have that in your brain before you go into the interview. So you have to be prepared um, and, and you have to kind of be able to educate the officer because they may not be educated. I guess I can say that, yeah. There you go. I mean, we can, to be fair, they might not be educated on your specific reason for right. coming to the U.S. Okay, so Pax East is coming back, and, you know, they're agreeing with all of the sentiments that we've said. It, it sounds hard. So what do we need to do? Well, you know, lobbying, Riot Games, a lot of the publishers have been lobbying and trying to push USCIS and others to make more effective policies. I mean, that's partly how we got those initial P visas that were granted. So, you know, a culture shift, it's not only gonna be USCIS, but in general, people. You know, we need people to understand gaming is not just for kids. It's not just something that people do as a hobby, but it is a real business and there are sponsors, there are big companies and teams and people who are ready to drop a lot of money on this. So we need to change it, and we need to change hearts and minds, so to speak. Right, right. right. So 
frankly, just more of a cultural acceptance of games generally as we're seeing and, and, and viewing it as an industry is coming, it's happening, right? Um, and so, um, but in terms of like legal acceptance, we're still a long ways off. I mean, uh, we don't know of any kinds of laws or lobbying efforts or those kinds of things, but we expect that as the industry matures, you know, literally every major league sports uh, organization has lobbied Congress at some time or another, right? That's just how things get done. All right. Back to our levels. Okay. okay. We level three? Is yeah. That, that we we are at level three now. Okay, Jacob, looks like it's a solo level. They, they are shark infested waters. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> fun fact I have a brother who always says that. We visit the beach, he's all like, I'm not stepping foot in the ocean. I'm all like, dude, chill, it'll be all right. So, um, okay, so now Paxis is saying Jacob has to get in the ocean? Uh, Okay, now I'm wet. All right, <laughs> so let's see here. Okay, we got another question. All right, what does everybody think? When you're recommending somebody to come in, what, what should you do? <laughs> A, just roll up. Just go into the ocean with the sword? <laughs> so I, I wouldn't actually, I wanna make sure, and this is something you do sometimes when you present legal information, right? So. I don't want you guys walking out of this presentation and be like, that lawyer said come in on a pee, right? Yeah. Like, that's just not how this works, okay? So um, I can't make any specific recommendations. Typically though, most people probably fine on a visitor's visa, but again, there's that education piece. Like, if you do get pulled aside, make sure you don't say, oh, this is what I do for a living. Say, well, I'm visiting uh, uh, at PAX, I'm visiting, I'm coming for a competition, or I'm gonna take home prize winnings, but don't say things about income or that kind of thing. As players are competing on teams more often, they're gonna be treated more like employees. So, P visas are more relevant than a B visa, but it's always gonna depend on your sp uh, specific circumstances, so that's why we say, hey, it depends, we'll talk to you, we're happy to consult with you about it. So we got another question. All right, so you know that you're coming in, you're gonna get some money, and it's not just prize winnings. What should you do? B, prob probably a P visa, right? So if it's not just prize money, if you are gonna be paid, if you're gonna be employed, um, we've already seen some P visa successes, but we've also seen some P visa failures. So one of the examples that we cited in the earlier slide, somebody had the P visa, they'd gone through the effort of putting together the packet, they would got an immigration bureaucrat to approve a visa traditionally for athletes for an esports gamer, right? And then still got denied, right? So you want to make sure that um, you do consult with a lawyer it, during the process and then as you're coming to the country, say, okay, we're, we're all set. Uh, and that means building the most compelling application possible, making sure that you understand what's gonna happen, what could potentially happen at the border. Um, and again, you know, we don't want to say that it's broken all the time. Of course, we have tons of international commerce. We have tons of immigrants legally coming in with non-immigrant visas day in and day out. But the specific problems that could arise if you're coming in uh, for something related to the gaming industry is just frankly being taken seriously. The, you know, literally, I, I think the PVC example was somebody who was coming for a Super Smash Brothers competition. One of them was. Right, and, and the border official said, yeah, that, there's no such thing, right? Like, it just doesn't exist. <laughs> you are lying to me, get on the plane, right? And so that is one of the problems that you might face as you look at this. I mean, this is, again, that culture shift of, yeah, sh so what, you play Smash. I play Smash with my buddies and eat some pizza on the weekends. Like, why would there be a big competition that deserves having a visa to come in? If you're just gonna hang out with your friends, no, I'm sorry, you got the wrong visa. Right. So, Pax Isia has another question. What all actually goes into a P1 visa application? What do we think? We've got all of the above over here. So um, you definitely do need a contract with a major US sports league team or international sporting event. So that is typical uh, for P1 visas. But in the context of gaming, you know, there's not like an MLB yet, right? There's nothing like that, uh, that that is recognized in the same way by border officials or those kinds of people. So 
you're gonna need something that's a parallel to that. And then the attorney, and, and you'd have to work with the attorney, if it's not us or somebody else in the, in, in the industry, and you hire some other attorney, they're gonna need to recognize, okay, I have to educate the, the border official, the USCIS bureaucrat, so I'm gonna need to compare this game competition with this sport, right? And there are a lot of niche sports out there that you could make that comparison to, right? Like there's, sure there's baseball and football and basketball, but there's also, and soccer, but there's also, you know, like water polo and there's, um, there's all sorts of niche areas, niche sports, CrossFit, that, yeah. <laughs> that you'd have to explain to a, a USCIS official so, more in depth. And one thing that we can say here, if you are one of the fortunate souls to be competing in a game competition that is actually sponsored by the publisher, like being sponsored by Riot or um, Valve, then you might be able to coordinate with them to get that documentation that you need. Um, that's going to be as close as we can get right now. Um, you know, you might be able to get, uh, as we've seen more player associations pop up, like LCS and uh, Counter-Strike now, all those union groups that are organizing, that might give it a little bit more weight, but you just want to do as much as you can to try to build your packet. Right, and so in addition to that initial contract, you're also gonna need at least two other pieces of evidence to indicate like the scope of the acclaim, the international draw of what you're doing. And so that evidence can, can vary a lot. We listed some of the evidences, you know, letters from authorities in, in the sport, in the e-sport uh, or in the game, um, and other kinds of, of rankings, listings. Those are also very helpful. Um, but you need at least two of those to support your application. If we're doing an application for a gaming visa, we're gonna look for three or four. And the reason for that is, well, what if, what if the USCIS official discounts one of them, right? So you don't want to look for the minimum when you're applying this kind of visa. You wanna go for the maximum. One of my uh, approaches to many immigration applications is just drown them in paper and see what happens. Um, and so I would like to fill out as many of those options as possible. Um, frequently, uh, we're discovering that when you work with somebody who is, excels in any area, it can be difficult to get them to do anything other than play the game <laughs> or, or practice for the sport. And so, um, it, it, but it's so very important that if competing in the U.S., practicing in the U.S., preparing in the U.S. is something they want to do, they have to devote at least some mental energy to getting some of these documents together. Um, and if they don't do it, maybe they have an assistant who will do it for them. But you have to think through, okay, uh, how am I going to get as much evidence as possible to prove this? And that's gonna help you at two stages. One, when you apply and you get approved, and two, when you come through and show that border official, if they do pull you aside, you can say, hey, look, I'm, this is what I did, and that will give them time and room to say, okay, come on in, right? So um, that's why that's important. Okay, so we've talked about what goes in, so, how does it actually work? What do you have to do? That's the next question. What do you do? I mean, A sounds pretty spe pretty specific. There's a form number. <laughs> <laughs> so most of those, right? So there are some there's some quirks about how the immigration process works. So you do fill out form I-129. It's the petition for a non-immigrant worker and it can be applied to a bunch of different visa types, okay? Um, including, in, in this case, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, a gaming visa, right? Um, you file the application, you wait anywhere between five weeks and four months. Now, that's from like last night. We checked last night, USCIS lists processing timelines for their visa, and if it's in Vermont, it's like five weeks to three months, and if it's being done in California, it's like two to four months, right? But We've seen processing times go up to eight months for P visas. Um, and then currently, because of COVID and other concerns, you'll see other visas go on much, much longer. I literally have a client that we filed for asylum for when I first started practicing in 2013, and they still have not had their asylum interview, right? And, and that is common. You need to know that that is common. So it's like a nine year delay. Um, we haven't, so we haven't really talked about asylum. I mean, the idea of somebody coming 
for fear or persecution in their home country. That's definitely a different process, different calculation. It doesn't always come up. It realistically wouldn't come up in most situations, um, maybe outside of some of the current events that are going on right now. Right. But um, yeah, just keep in mind that when we're trying to schedule for these competitions and things, we have not only the competition deadline, your training, your practice, everything that you personally need to do to get ready or your company needs to do, but you also have to do that against the timeline and the deadlines with USCIS. So even though some humanitarian family-based visas tend to drag on quite a bit, um, I think currently for green cards based on family membership, it can take up to a year or more. But with employment visas, you typically have an out. You can pay for premium processing. It's an extra $2,500 for P visas, and you'll get a decision in 15 days. That does not mean you'll get an approval in 15 days. You're not paying extra money to get approved. You're just paying extra money for them to hurry up. Um, and so for many clients who have a tight deadline or, or who you know just want it done now, it's totally worth it to pay an extra 25K, uh, not 25K, 2K, <laughs> 2.5K, to have this figured out quickly. Um, and, and so that's a, a tool that's available to use if you've got it dragging on and you need it done now. But you also do want to keep in mind 2,500 bucks. For a lot of people, that is not nothing. You know, right. um, that's the only way that you can really expedite it. I mean, we've been working on humanitarian parole applications for people who are coming from Afghanistan. And there's a specific process to go through for that. We have been told, you know, you can work on it, put expedite on there, put multicolored pages so that it stands out. But at the end of the day, USCIS will decide, are we gonna expedite this? Or are we gonna put it with all of the other papers and no organization, just in the empty room? So. Right, right. That, that's one of the things you need to recognize is that our immigration system is, frankly, it's just overloaded. So that's, people love here. It's a, it's a, it's a party in the USA, right? Okay, well, there are no more questions about PVCs in the water, so we're gonna catch up with James at the next level. Okay, it looks like this is the final quest, Ian. So, <laughs> thank you, everybody. Okay, um, <laughs> now, I guess this is the castle of blindfold. We finally made it, which means we're on the final level. Let's see what we need to do now. You have to answer all of the questions, James. I mean, the internet have... asking me to answer all of the questions all of the time. All Why? of the questions. I, I can't answer every question. Well, let's answer as many as we can. So Pax East just says there's a big one near the castle. Let's take a look. All right, let's see what the first question is. What do we say, people? It depends. It depends. <laughs> do you have an immigration problem or do you have? No, it's, uh, it's not the only issue you're gonna come up with. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the short and sweet. If we're talking about immigration in the gaming context, immigration is one factor, but if you're an athlete, if you're coming over to commentate, whatever your reason is, you've got a contract that you have to worry about and the legal requirements and obligations there. If you're dealing with sponsorships, then maybe you have to deal with those aspects of the law. If you're a studio, you're hiring talent, employment law, intellectual property, do you control the rights that you're trying to license if you are? your trademarks, your branding, all of that is stuff that comes up in gaming. And it's also, you know, within our very small niche of immigration law too. So I know I'm off screen, but I thought I'd pitch in here. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot that comes up that's outside of immigration law when somebody comes into the, into the country, or frankly, that you encounter every day. Um, when you go to law school and they talk about like property rights and things like that, you know, you, you make, uh, you go through five or six legal processes each morning, right? You know, when you, when you come in here to PAX, you know, is a bailment created because I have my bag here? Who's legally liable if it goes missing? You know, there are all these things that just happen in the background. If you start uh, selling products without registering a business, well, you're still a sole proprietorship in the eyes of the IRS, right? And that just magically happened and you have a business. Um, the same thing with copyright and intellectual property. You take a picture, literally every photo on your phone, you own the copyright to. It's yours, that is your intellectual property, right? And so um, 
all these legal things happen. But when you have a business, when you're making a career in an industry that is arguably still very new, and the laws are 20 years behind where the industry itself is, what do you do? And so um, that's where a good lawyer does come in handy. Um, and so if you're starting to make an income, if you're starting to have um, success uh, as a professional in this gaming space, in this gaming industry, it makes sense to have a lawyer on hand in the way that you would think of, okay, I need to have my accountant on hand and I talk to them once a year at tax time and a couple times throughout the year. You need a lawyer to help you get organized with your business organization, your contracts. Um, you can absolutely hire a lawyer one off for an immigration issue, one off for a contract issue. Um, but we've worked with a company or two and uh, they'll come to us and say, I really need a contract. And then eventually it leads to a conversation where we say, hey, how about we work on you with your contract strategy? We'll draft one kind of master agreement that you use, and then we're gonna make this easier for you moving forward, and you need to file all of these so that you can, you know, and so there are some intellectual property strategies and some business strategies that you can really take advantage of if you, if you do talk to a lawyer and say, okay, I'm gonna get squared away on this topic, I'm gonna stay organized. And so that's important for companies and individuals. And so one other thing, just because I haven't explicitly said it, we're dealing with games. It's very different than traditional sports and dealing with immigration because ultimately at the end of the day, your publishing company owns the rights to those IPs, right? So if they say, hey, we're gonna cut this or you know, no, we're not gonna officially license this tournament, then you could show up, you have your visa that's validly approved, you're in the United States and then Oh, COVID, we decided we're not gonna do this. Now you have to get out of the United States. There's so many other things that pop up that are very local just in the gaming space. So you have to kind of respect and understand that with the publishing companies, you're gonna have to really be organized is the short of it. Right, and so, you know, the gaming industry keeps evolving. Um, but like we've already said, there's this gap. That was level one, the gap between where the law ends and where the video game industry begins. And so a lot of times when you have a legal question, there may not be a good legal answer, right? It just may not have happened yet. There may not be a law on it. I think the average age of Congress is like 63 or 64. And the average age of federal judges is also up there. And there just aren't a lot of federal judges who kick back in their chambers and, you know, put up Super Smash Brothers, right? So, um, although I would love to know that judge if there is one. Uh, so a lot of legal questions don't have great answers. And so the best an attorney can do is look at parallels in different industries and try to apply those answers to your situation. Uh, but you'd want somebody to, to, to do that. And I'll share one quick story. I had a client uh, recently who came back to me and at the beginning of their immigration process, I said, okay, you've got these problems, and they can be overcome, but it's a three-step process. We're gonna do A, B, and C, and these are my costs for each step. And we got done with A, and we got A approved, and then the husband did some research online and just went and did D on his own, <laughs> and that got denied. So then they called me back, and I explained everything to them again, and then he went and did C on his own, and then they called me up and said, hey, I'm about to leave the country. I'm like, you can't leave the country. They won't let you back in. You didn't do B, you know? And so $2,000 in government fees later, they're back to me and we're starting over, right? And so um, it's kind of rough, right? And, and so sometimes you think, well, I don't have the money to hire a lawyer. Uh, I think that if you step back uh, in your gaming profession or gaming career, you might realize, I can't afford to not have a lawyer. Um, I'll save more money this way. And so, again, that's the power of, of strategy, particularly in the wild west of the law, which is what gaming is. And just one final thing. I mean, we're talking about filing fees. If you've got um, some of these processes, you're gonna have filing fees from anywhere to a couple hundred dollars up to a couple thousand dollars just with USCIS. If you are coming with family, and you're trying to get visas for them, you don't just, you don't always get to include them in with your one single filing fee. You have to add in potentially for other ones. So that's not necessarily applicable to some of the visas that we're talking about, but something where you're like, oh, I'm just gonna go hang out in this other country, or I'm gonna come to the United States for this one competition can easily 
rack up all of the government filing fees, plus legal, plus your just ex general expected expenses. Yeah, so to kind of summarize what we're, what we're at here in this last level, the final question, right, is that there are going to be infinite questions uh, on legal topics. And as, you know, I, I think that there will be times when the law will catch up but then it just doesn't change fast enough to keep up. There will always be a gap between where the laws are and, and where the industry is. Um, and so the best way to get a solid answer is not Googling online. You can absolutely you know, find lots of good information out there. We're not saying that I mean, we're online, we're on Twitch, right? Yeah. So um, there's stuff there, but you want somebody talking to you um, at a certain point in your career, it becomes a good idea. All right. We did it, James. There we go. There's a big <laughs> relief right there. All right, so. Oh, we've look. got an outgoing threat from Blindfold. So maybe he'll be back next year, guys. Who knows? <laughs> All right. Thank you for playing our game with us. PAX Port Edition. We did license all of the images and audio from Adobe Stock, and we just want to remind you that legal information is not legal advice. Um, but we wanted to open up the panel for questions from you. We've got some minutes. If there was anything we went over too quick, now's a chance to let us know. I believe the microphone back there is live. Is that in the middle points? towards the cameras? In if the middle you, towards the yeah, camera. Please feel free to line up, and uh, we'll we'll take your burning we legal questions and see what we can do. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, um, my question is what advice would you have for undergraduates looking to go to law school who really want to work in this type of law? Like what type of internships do you think would be really helpful and what type of experience and things like that? Do you want to? I'll, I'll, let, I'll let James okay. answer that one. All right, so here's the thing. There are definitely firms out there that are very established. ESG, they are you know, a great example of what could happen, right? So um, when you're an undergrad, this is a little bit different than being in law school, but you know, think about what all you're trying to accomplish and then think about what tools you can equip yourself with. If you wanna go to law school, then it's possible that you're gonna think about something that's more writing oriented, organization oriented, and um, outside of getting ready for law school, that's not all undergrad is. I just want to make that very clear. You don't have to spend your whole time saying, I'm going to do political science, I'm going to do an English major. That's not what you have to do. So you can also take things if you're interested in a specific industry. Um, I was interested in uh, working with artists and creators, so I also did a couple uh, courses there. Stay in tune with your industry. Figure out what's happening. If I had known at the time that gaming would go into the metaverse, then maybe I would have took some more like uh, computer science classes or things. But um, you know, enjoy your time. And by the time that you get to law school, for each undergrad and law school, you're not going to know everything. So you just kind of have to be very patient with yourself and um, try to make it a good experience. Because by the time that you get out and you start practicing, you're, you're not going to have the institutional support in a lot of cases. And uh, if you do clinics and things in uh, your courses, then you, you know, you'll have people who can say, oh, well, you messed up. That's not a big deal. But once you pass the bar, you're the attorney. You have to worry about your own ethical obligations and other things. So um, you know, do what you need to if you feel like you're struggling with writing or organizational skills, things that might help as an attorney then work on those, but also just stay tuned with whatever the industry you're wanting to dive into. I want to tackle this one a little bit too. So um, so I started my own firm after graduating law school. Um, it, it happened kind of by accident. I mean, I always knew when I was in law school I wanted to have my own firm, but it happened much sooner than I expected because I literally just could not find a job in the 2012 economy. It was still one of the worst years to graduate as a lawyer. And I, I wanted to do a focus on intellectual property, but I was fluent in Spanish and immigration clients kept coming out of the woodwork, right? So, um, so 
for me and for us, uh, you know, I don't want to imply that we're veterans in this industry. We're still kind of new. We've gotten some streaming related clients as of about two years ago, and we've been working in this space. The whole time I've been doing some business clientele. And, and so I, you know, we feel competent to advise clients. I definitely feel super competent in the immigration space. But I, I don't want you to walk away and be like, oh, those guys only do video game law. We do, we do a bunch of things, um, primarily immigration, and, and we're growing into the space and loving every minute. The other thing I would say is um, don't be afraid to be a gamer. I actually have um, someone who helps me with the firm admin back at the office. And um, when he came in for his interview, he didn't have anything on the resume that indicated gaming. And the interview was okay. It wasn't anything stand out. And then I said, well, but do you have anything where like you manage a lot of pieces, you know, because it can get kind of difficult in the office. And he stopped, and I could see him looking at me and calculating what to say next. And he goes, well, I manage a uh, group on WoW. I, and he just dove into this explanation about World of Warcraft. And I'm thinking in my head, this is the guy. This is the guy, right? And so you know, people list on their resume all the time. Uh, uh, you know, they'll put like interests, like kayaking and reading books, like put like League of Legends, you know, like put down gaming on your resume and say, hey, look, I do devote two hours of a day to this um, and I'm not ashamed of it. Uh, it's, it's, it the, the exciting thing about wanting to do this in law is that it's still a new industry. So even by the time you graduate from law school, it might still be a new fledgling industry. And so there's probably room for you, right? Um, so that's what I would say, is, is just um, keep gaming and, and keep, keep your dreams going, go to law school. And um, I do want to make sure we say this, thank you for asking the question. One last little point here is that even if you can't work at a firm like ESG right out of law school, do what you need to do, right. get some experience. Um, when I first started, I was doing document review, I wasn't working with the firm. Then in January 2020, I got hired to work with Tengen Law and I've been doing everything since. We're trying to, like he said, we're trying to build the practice. If you don't have somebody who's as uh, open to building a new practice area, then you know, work at a litigation firm if you want to do contract litigation or other things so that you can get the experience and exposure. Um, so many people that I've heard from in the esports industry, um, a couple of attorneys who are gonna do a presentation later, they talk about transitioning in. So I'm an employment lawyer, and now I'm gonna help athletes. That's like Ryan Fairchild's story. Um, you know, you can ask the other attorneys how they transition. So for me, that's kind of been my experience too, trying to slowly tiptoe in, but yeah. All right, so. There are more questions, yeah. but we'll be at the, the other legal presentation tonight as well, and we'll be available after you can ask us more questions. All right. Thank you guys so much, it was really helpful advice. Hello. Um, I'm curious as to what you gentlemen think is the sort of desirable end state for a lot of this video game related immigration law. Is it that you have sort of an ecosystem of acknowledged leagues who essentially take care of all of the filing processes and fees and whatnot on behalf of the athletes or is it going to have to remain sort of an every person for themselves? trying to get into a tournament that they may or may not eventually be able to attend. It, it seems like the, the chaos is unsustainable somehow. Yeah, so w let's, let's talk about some of that chaos. Immigration is chaotic no matter the industry, so I don't think that's going anywhere. Um, what I would say about where I think it'll actually land, um, there are some laws that prevent like employers from making the employee pay for the immigration fees. So there are some kinds of applications in that vein. Um, it, where, where I think we'll land is, um, where, I'd, where I'd like to see us land is, you know how the P1 visa says you have to have a contract with a major league sports team or union or whatever? Um, we'll have some recognized major league esports groups that you can have a, a contract signed with so that that's like evidence of it. I think that that's one place we'll head. Um, and then I think that it would be nice if um, there literally is a set aside, I think in the H-1B visas for fashion models. And so if there was a set aside for esports gamers, that's kind of, that's what I think is feasible today. I don't see any big lobbying movement to make any of this happen. But if, if I'm, if somebody, if a, if a 
gaming company or group were to ask me, hey, what do you think is possible, Jacob? Those would be the first two things that I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, morning. Um, I was wondering if you all had any experience with employers, I'm sorry, with employees dealing with like remote work and like the post potential like law or like tax implications of that and what your experience has been? Remote work out of the country or? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we see five minutes. Well, um, so if you've got somebody working internationally and you're just paying them? Yeah. All right, and um, I mean, there's nothing to stop. I mean, you can pay them like as a contractor is probably the simplest way. I, I'm not sure if that's the question though. Uh, so actually, I'll just ask you after. Okay, all right, so yeah. more details. That yeah. seems fair. Hello. Um, just hold on a second. Uh, I have some notes. Okay, so you talked about, um, you know, uh, laws of precedent, right? I'm not very literate with law, so I don't know many of these terms, but That's have right. you used any of international, you know, um, cases to present in the US? I mean, uh, as far as I know, uh, Korea, or at least South Korea and China are the biggest ones with the esports and the um, recognized players, right? Have you used any of that on the court, you know, to show it as some kind of precedent or something like that? Um, I mean, I think when it comes to, to gaming visas, it's always helpful to, to, you know, pull out what's available and say, hey, look, this has been done before. We're not treading new ground. Precedent is always persuasive. Um, to be honest, most of our clientele is not from Asia, though, so uh, I, I, I mm -hmm. wouldn't necessarily you know, know the answer to that specific question. I mean, this, okay. just, this just kind of goes back to, we're slowly tiptoeing our way in. Um, we do have a lot of our clients who are from Central American countries. So if we're working with um, people and who, and Europe, we're dealing with a lot of um, similar types of things. And as we get into it, you know, like we said, you just need to be able to explain, hey, Super Smash Bros, Dota 2, all of these things are legitimate, and the more paperwork, the more evidence that you have, you're going to put yourself in the best position. Uh, can I ask one more? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, you talked about South America. What's the biggest esport there? Because I'm just curious. You know, what's the biggest thing that from South America that many esports players come to ask for a visa or something? Probably Brazil, right? Yeah. Um, most of our esports stuff doesn't come out of South America, though. Most of that's humanitarian work is what we're doing. So we do a lot of asylum. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, that was it. Thank right. you. Um, so the resources that we presented on the slide presentation are available on our website here. And we want to thank you for attending our presentation. We very much are very, very grateful. And this link. Thank you, everybody. This link or QR code does take you to the website. So if you didn't see that, you can check it out there. Thanks. <laughs>